Hi friends, welcome back to Tony's tutorial and today we are going to discuss a very interesting topic from the chapter Hip Complex Biomechanics and I promise you that's going to be very interesting and very fun to learn provided you understand the essence and key points. So stay, stay tight and listen to the points with a clear mind. Shall we discuss? Yes. And this is where, exactly, the biomechanics comes into action in hip complex to understand the movement science that is happening in the hip complex. And we are going to discuss that that topic is known as the function in hip complex. Yes, the function in hip complex means the movement in hip complex. You know that what are the movements that are possible in the hip joint? That is your flexion, that is your extension, that is abduction, adduction, external rotation and internal rotation. These are the six possible movement or three combination of movement that is possible in the hip complex. Now as biomechanists we are going to learn how this movement is going to happen. Yes. Can you predict that we can define the movement in two simple manner that is the motion of femur on the pelvis that is and second one motion on the pelvis on the femur. Motion of femur on the pelvis means the pelvis is fixed. The pelvis is fixed. You cannot move it. Your femur is moving. What does it happen in your daily life? Can you just imagine? Any ideas? Yes, this happens when you're walking, when I'm taking this class, when I'm dancing, when I'm doing something fun, when I'm running, jumping, or the femur is moving, your pelvis is relatively fixed. So that is the first thing, motion on of femur on the pelvis. So pelvis is fixed, or the hip bone is fixed, but the femur is moving. That is the first classification. Second one is the opposite stage, where the femur is fixed, but your pelvis is moving. Can anyone tell me an example? Yes, uh, when you are standing straight like this in the weight bearing position, here only the pelvis can move forward, anti lateral, rotation, etc. But not your femur. The femur is relatively fixed. So there are two situations in life that is the motion of femur on a pelvis and motion of a pelvis on a femur. We are going to have first motion of pelvis or motion of femur on the pelvis. And there are three possible motion, motion three combinations that is flexion bar, extension, right? Abduction bar, adduction, yes, and internal rotation bar, external rotation or medial rotation bar, lateral rotation. These are the three possible movements. Now, flexion and extension. What is the movement happening? Can you imagine which plane does the flexion in the hip joint happen? The plane is the sagittal plane. Yes, the plane is sagittal plane. The flexion extension happens in the sagittal plane. If it is sagittal plane, what should be the axis? The axis should be piercing the joint. That is an x-axis or the coronal axis. Thus, this is the axis and through this axis, this flexion and extension happens. And the axis is coronal axis. Clear? The movement in flexion extension happens in the sagittal plane and in the coronal axis. Now the normal movement that is possible is 90 to 120 degree. 90 to 120 degree. Why there is a great, great difference in the range between hip flexion? This is the range of hip flexion. Hip flexion possible is 90 to 120 degree. For example, when you're standing straight with your knees straight, okay, in this position, you go for the hip flexion, maximum possible is 90 degree. But if you are going to flex your knee, then the hip flexion can increase up to 120 degrees. See, this is an example. So I have a request when you are listening to this class, all of you should stand from your place and experiment this and listen to the class. For example, you should do it. Then only you can learn it. If you are standing up right now, you are standing straight, attempt the hip flexion. It can be a maximum of 90 degrees. But if you are going to flex your knee, it is going to be 120 degree so there is a difference okay so that is 90 to 120 degree and extension possible is 
10 to 30 degree the extension of the knee is relatively less that is maximum 10 to 30 degree you cannot go more than that the extension possible is 10 to 30 degree so we are going to study about the flexion extension it happens in the sagittal plane and coronal axis flexion 90 to 120 degree extension 10 to 30 degree now what are the movement that is happening my dear friends, uh, you know that this is a ball and socket type of joint. This is a ball and socket type of joint. And in ball and socket type of joint, there is a unique motion known as convex concave rule or concave convex rule. What is that? Can anyone tell me? What is that? Yes, in convex concave rule or concave convex rule, you know that there are two types of motion. One is arthrokinematic, osteokinematic. This is osteokinematic movement. This is osteokinematic. But this movement that is happening inside, spinning, gliding, sliding, these are the arthrokinematic movement. So this both occurs opposite. For example, when a convex articular surface, this is the convex, this is a concave cavity, convex, concave. Now this is when this is moving, when this goes for flexion, or when this goes for anterior motion, there is a gliding happening in the inside of the joint, that is to the posterior. So, see, now this is going for extension front, the head of the femur moves backward. So, in flexion and extension, what happens is, when the femoral head moves, or for reference, we will take the shaft of the femur, okay. When the distal end of the femur moves forward, its proximal end or articular surface moves backward. So in flexion, when flexion femur moves back anteriorly, the head of the femur moves backwards. Illustrated by this, this is the example, going forward and here the head of the femur moves backwards. And similarly, in extension, you just see that. In extension, I'm going for the extension. What happens to the head of the femur? The head of the femur moves anteriorly. So, in extension, head of the femur moves anteriorly inside the joint cavity and distal end or the shaft of the femur moves posteriorly. Clear? That is the difference. Osteokinematics and arthrokinematics. But there is also one more thing to note down. That is, in pure standing position, in the erect standing position or in the neutral position, if you are attempting a flexion, there is no gliding happening in the femur. There is no gliding happening in the femur. The femur is spinning posteriorly. There is a pure spin that is happening because that is a pure flexion movement. That is in the normal position. There is no abduction, there is no associated movements. So this, there occurs only flexion. There is, occurs only spinning movement. But for example, if we are slightly abducted, if the leg is slightly abducted, now you go for flexion. The same happens where glide plus spin happens. So in neutral position, if flexion or extension is attempted, that is only a spin. In extension, it is pure posterior anterior spin. In flexion, it is pure posterior spin. That's all about the flexion and extension. Can I summarize it for you? That is occurring in the sagittal plane, occurs in the coronal axis, flexion is 90 to 120 degree and extension is 10 to 30 degree and the osteokinematics and arthrokinematics occur opposite to each other. The reason is convex articular surface on the concave illustrated by convex concave rule. Here in the movement, when the movement occurs anteriorly, in flexion, distal end of the femur moves back anteriorly, the proximal end or the head of the femur moves posteriorly, gliding plus spinning happens there. And in a posterior extension, there is gliding plus spinning in the anterior direction. And in pure neutral position, there is no gliding, only pure spin movement. Clear? Now, moving to the next movement, that is abduction erection. Abduction, erection. Okay. Which which plane can you tell me? Abduction. This this the abduction. This is the abduction. Which plane can it occur? That occurs in the which plane? That occurs in the coronal plane. Sorry, frontal plane. That occurs in the frontal plane. Yes, frontal frontal plane occurs in the frontal plane. And in which axis? Which axis can it occur? It occurs in the eighth axis. It occurs in the AP axis. See? So, the movement that is the abduction of the hip, for example, I'm illustrating with my right leg, going for abduction. This happens in the coronal plane. This is corresponding to the abduction in the shoulder. So, this happens in the coronal plane. 
and the axis will be piercing from back to front like this that is the AP axis so the movement occurs in that frontal plane AP axis and the movement is about 40 to 50 degree abduction abduction is around 40 to 50 degree whereas adduction is little uh, less that is limited 20 to 30 degree adduction is 20 to 30 degree all of you can stand with me if, if that is good you stand and just do the abduction abduction that is maximum possible up to 40 to 45 degree or 50 degree but the adduction this is limited you cannot adduct more that is maximum is 20 to 30 degree so adduction is limited 20 to 30 degree abduction is not limited it is up to 40 to 50 degree and what about the inside movement arthrokinematics and osteokinematics in abduction what happens in abduction there is gliding and spinning movement in the opposite direction and in adduction also there is gliding and spinning movement in the opposite direction for example see this one you're going for adduction like this you're going for adduction like this what happens what happens inside you are, let us uh, illustrate from the neutral position you're going for glide this one uh, abduction like this what happens to the head of the femur see when you are going for outward rotation the head of the femur is going for inward rotation that is the head of the when your uh, shaft is moving anterior superiorly the head of the move femur moves inferiorly there is gliding and sliding opposite direction movement when you are going for adduction like this you are going for adduction like this what happens to the head of the femur it is going upwards upwards but the head this one is going for inward movement so that is also opposite motion let me summarize that for you it is in the frontal plane it is in the ap axis 40 to 50 is the abduction 20 to 30 is the adduction and in abduction the head of the femur the abduction and in abduction the distal end of the femur moves outward or uh, outward laterally but the head of the femur moves inwards a adduction head of the femur moves uh, distal end moves inwards uh, the head of the femur inside the joint cavity the arthrokinematics occurs upwards so there is gliding and spinning movement possible and that occurs opposite to the movement in the distal extremity or the osteokinematics clear and here we have the internal and external rotation internal and external rotation which plane is it happening the internal and external rotation can you imagine that is in the what plane we have we have only one more plane left that is in the transverse plane transverse plane very good transverse plane the axis would be a vertical axis the axis is a vertical axis see this one this is the internal rotation this is the external rotation this is media rotation this is the lateral rotation this is media this is the lateral this is internal this is external same term so it happens in the vertical axis sorry the vertical axis and the transverse plane here also there is arthrokinematics and osteokinematics occurring opposite to each other there is arthrokinematics and osteokinematics occurring opposite to each other and the normal range is 42 to 50 degree and the normal range that is possible is 42 to 50 degree of internal rotation or external rotation see you can just try this one do with me this is internal rotation this is external rotation in external rotation and internal rotation maximum range of possible is 40 to 50 degree it occurs in the transverse plane and it occurs in the vertical axis for example in the hand we were doing the internal rotation external rotation that was happening in the transverse plane so the same movement will happen here also in the transverse plane i hope that it is clear about the movement of femur on the pelvis now let us move forward see i want to tell you there are a lot of factors that determine the role of femur on the pelvis like the structural change whether we are doing the passive movement or active this all different differentiate or this all makes a difference in the range of motion okay but the one of the major important factor is insufficiency in the muscles insufficiency in two joint muscles the x the active insufficiency in two joint muscles there are a lot of two joint muscles that is crossing the hip one is rectus femoris we discussed in the front of the thigh then you have hamstring here then you have gracilis here so all these muscles are going to limit your movements 
this all muscles are going to limit your available motion for example later earlier we saw that this is the flexion that is possible here flexion is limited to 90 degree why because hamstring is tight the hamstring is getting stretched over there the muscles cannot possibly lengthen so what happens it limits the motion and if you are releasing the tension in the hamstring by flexing your knee now this is possible see now this is possible to a greater degree right and similarly the extension now the extension is possible okay now uh, you have the rectus femoris muscle which is acting as the extension of the knee and hip flexor now if you are doing for this one if you are flexing your knee and going for extension there is a difference there is a difference see that is the difference so these two joint muscles are going to reduce the range of motion when they are stretched out or when they are actively working in two different joints at the same time similarly glacialis can reduce the abduction that is possible if it is being recruited in the two joint simultaneously and tensor fascia lata okay and tensor fascia lata is going to remove uh, limit your adduction possible if it is if it is going to stretch in the two joints so the muscles are like one rectus femoris the hamstring muscle the hamstring muscle and the next one it is a gracilis muscle the gracilis muscle which limits the abduction and you have the tensor fascia at the tfl or the it band which limits the adduction possible this limits the hip flexion that is possible this limits the extension that is possible this is because both these muscles has all these muscles have two functions in two joints that uh, they, are they are traveling in they are attached to so when both joints they are recruited simultaneously it can produce in the less range of motion so my dear friends with that we discuss the motion of femur and the pelvis we cleared it up the motion of the femur and the pelvis is femur is fixed femur is moving and the pelvis is moving pelvis is fixed and the movement that is possible is flexion extension abduction adduction medial rotation lateral rotation and you have to note the general range of motion that is possible and the arthrokinematic movement that is going to happen opposite okay that's all and finally you have to remember about some two joint muscles that are going to reduce the range of motion possible in that joint clear now moving on to the next that is motion of motion of pelvis on the femur pelvis on the femur this is very interesting this is going to be interesting and the example for this is i'm standing like this my femur is fixed and i'm moving anteriorly going for the hip extension see this is the neutral position okay now you imagine my hands are placed over here i'm going like this this is a hip extension is happening this is hip flexion is happening this is lateral shift is happening this is lateral shift happening lateral tilt is happening all this movement can occur with the femur fixed how that moment is going to take place that's what we are going to describe and before that i want to tell you something like in the upper limb for example when you are going for the flexion of the elbow the rotation and flexion what happens in spinning and the flexion what happens is that the radius and ulna is moving similarly when radius and ulna is moving anteriorly the fem the humerus can move posteriorly too that a movement can occur reciprocally but we are not able to visualize it because the distal end is moving completely but here when in this uh, hip joint it is impossible to see the movement inside the hip joint inside the uh, femur movement of the femur it is important because of the muscle bulk and the pelvic cavity but you can easily illustrate the pelvic movement the lateral shift medial shift the rotation etc etc so that is why here that is a bit more important so how the flexion and extension how medial rotation lateral rotation how external rotation internal rotation happens with the help of the pelvis that is we are going to that is what we are going to discuss so here remember in your mind the femur is fixed when i'm telling you example always remember the femur is fixed and it cannot move only your pelvis can move and there are some possible movements that are known as the anterior and posterior tilt anterior and posterior tilt anterior and posterior tilt of the femur the second movement possible is lateral pelvic tilt anterior and posterior tilt of the pelvis what is anterior and posterior pelvic tilt 
See, let us uh, discuss that in a simple manner possible. You know that the femur is fixed, so forget about that. No need to worry about that. Here you have the anterior superior iliac spine. Here you have the posterior superior iliac spine. In normal resting position, the pelvis is rested in such a way, the anterior, there is a horizontal line that is passing through the anterior superior iliac spine and the posterior superior iliac spine. So this both iliac spine can be connected with the help of a, with both this pelvis uh, can be connected with help of a horizontal line. So that is our reference point. A horizontal line can connect your anterior superior iliac spine and the posterior superior iliac spine. Now, similarly, when you are placed it like this, there is a line, vertical line, that is passing through the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis, pubic symphysis and the symphysis. So, there is a vertical line that is going to pass from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pelvis, pubic so big symphysis, and there is another vertical line joining the um, anterior superior iliac spine and posterior superior iliac spine. Now, in anterior pelvic tilt, what is going to happen? In anterior pelvic tilt, there is nothing going to happen. No to worry. The pelvis just tilt anteriorly. So our reference point will be anterior superior iliac spine, pubic symphysis, and if needed, we will take the posterior superior iliac spine. So what happens in anterior pelvic tilt? Now, see, just I can illustrate in one of the simplest manner. Okay, in anterior pelvic tilt. See, this is the position and this is the anterior pelvic tilt. This pelvis, this anterior superior iliac spine will move anteriorly. When anterior superior iliac spine is moving anteriorly, imagine this is moving anteriorly, this is moving anteriorly, this is moving anteriorly. The symphysis pubis, what can happen? It can move inferiorly. So in anterior pelvic tilt, what happens is the anterior superior iliac spine moves anteriorly and posterior superior, anterior superior iliac spine moves anteriorly and inferiorly and symphysis pubis also moves inferiorly. So that is all about anterior pelvic tilt. When anterior superior iliac spine is moving anteriorly, the posterior superior iliac spine can move upwards. The posterior superior iliac spine can move upwards. How can you illustrate that? For example, uh, I have arranged my belt in the position of iliac crest, okay? Now, I am placing my hands for the reference. See, my both hands in place, they are in the same line, okay? Now, when I am going for anterior pelvic tilt, my hand will move like this, inwards, okay? That is, the anterior superior iliac spine. See, for example, my, let my fingers take the reference point of the anterior superior iliac spine, okay? Let this fingers. Now, what happens in anterior pelvic? Please, all of you stand up and uh, if you are doing it with me, it would be good. So, let us do it together. So, what happens is that you place this and palpate your anterior superior leg spine. It is easy to palpate. It's a prominent ridge over there. Okay. Now, in, our, in anterior to the iliac crest, you can easily palpate the iliac crest and anterior to it, you have the anterior superior leg crest. You place the hand over there and in anterior pelvic, move your pelvic, move your pelvis or uh, Tuck in your tummy, you are doing it like this. See what happens, my hand moves downwards. My hand moves downwards, that is your anterior, my anterior superior leg spine moves anteriorly and inwards. What about my pubis symphysis, it also moves inferiorly. So what about my posterior hand, my thumb over here, it was placed in the same line. This will move upwards. So this will move up. So this will move upwards and this will move anteriorly. That is known as the anterior pelvic tilt. And this, that is known as the anterior pelvic tilt. Now, what about the posterior pelvic tilt? If you have understood this, you can tell me what is posterior pelvic tilt. In posterior pelvic tilt, the, simple, the thing is opposite. That is the anterior superior iliac spine moves anteriorly and pubic symphysis also moves superiorly. Anterior superior iliac spine moves superiorly, pubic symphysis also moves superiorly. That is your posterior superior iliac spine will move posteriorly. This is simple to visualize. You place your hand over that same place itself and you just elevate this one like this. You elevate your tummy upwards. What is happening? My hand which was in this position is coming to this position. That is anterior superior iliac spine coming upwards. Pipic symphysis is comfort. Uh, your uh, posterior superior iliac spine is moving downward. This is the uh, posterior pelvic tilt. 
and this is the posterior pelvic tip and that was the and this is the anterior pelvic tip you're tucking in your tummy that position so clear that is all about that anterior and posterior pelvic tip throughout in your professional career you have to remember this when you are evaluating gait of a patient when you are evaluating sacroiliac joint dysfunction when you are treating back pain lower back pain or any sort of disorders in the hip or pelvis and even in the whole posture of the body or even in the gait you have to remember this so anterior superior leg spine moves anteriorly and inferiorly and posterior superior leg spine with this reference my my thumb moves upwards so both are in the same line like this and in here it moves upwards and this moves downward in the other case this moves downwards and this moves upwards that's all okay and remember see in when posterior pelvic tilt this is posterior pelvic tilt what movement is happening in the hip the hip is going for extension see this is a neutral position uh, this is neutral zero degree and this see it is going for extension so posterior pelvic tilt can result in extension anterior pelvic tilt can result in flexion anterior pelvic tilt can result in you don't have to move your trunk, trunk okay you have to move only this part so anterior pelvic tilt can result in flexion so anterior pelvic tilt result in the hip joint flexion posterior pelvic tilt result in hip joint extension but you may well, you may get confused if you are not taking this as a fixed one for example when you are taking the post anterior posterior tilt okay you might think that this may produce extension but this is not moving this is fixed you should remember that this is fixed okay then you will understand that that will go for the extension and in extension what happens this is moving backwards the femur will move near to the symphysis, femur will move near to the sacrum and in anterior, femur will move away from the sacrum, okay, right, that's all about the anterior and posterior pelvic tilt, something that you should always remember and the next thing that is the lateral pelvic tilt and that is, sorry, that is the lateral pelvic tilt, lateral pelvic tilt. This is also easy to understand. I had already told you the reference point. For example, you are placing your hands on your uh, iliac crest, upper of your iliac crest in the anterior superior iliac spine and take my belt for the reference. What happens is that this do not happen in the bilateral stance. That is, you are standing with your one leg lifted. That is known as unilateral. This is unilateral stance. This is bilateral stance. In bilateral stance, you forget about the lateral pelvic tip. In unilateral stance, let us focus about the lateral pelvic tip. What happens is that in unilateral stance, for example, I'm standing like this. Okay, this is my right leg. Okay, and one more thing I want to tell you um, that is that in bilateral stance. If you are placing a straight line there in this, this will pass through the iliac crest straightly. There won't be any difference. More the iliac crest, it will pass straight. This straight line will connect both the iliac crest in the both planes. In lateral pelvic tilt, what is happening is that this pelvis, one of the pelvis will move upward. One of the pelvis will move upward. And the other, the same pelvis can move downwards. So that is lateral pelvic tilt. I will explain to you an easy manner. For example, in this position, you're standing like this. But all of you, please stand with me. Let us do it in a simple manner. If you're standing like this, you take your left leg as the reference point. Your left leg is your reference point. Remember, your left leg is your reference point and it's not going to change. Your left leg is your reference point. You have to forget about that. Now you have to think about the only the right leg. Now you are standing like this. What happens? All of you, please stand in the bilateral stance. Now you go for the unilateral stance. What is happening to your pelvis? Your pelvis is moving upwards. Now there is two options for your pelvis. The pelvis can move upward or pelvis can move downward. This is also a unilateral stance, okay? In unilateral stance, the pelvis can move downward like this, pelvis can move upwards. For example, let me show you with my hand. In unilateral stance, this is the normal position. Uh, the pelvis can move upward like this, the pelvis can move downward like this. Pelvis can move upward, pelvis can move downward. That movement of the pelvis, the movement, the lateral movement of the pelvis upward or downward. This is known as hiking, up hiking, and this is known as down. Okay, this is uh, hiking and lowering. Okay, hiking. This is up hiking. See, the pelvis is going for a hike. Okay, and this is going for downward movement. This movement is possible in the uh, unilateral stance. These movements are known as the lateral pelvic tilt. So, in lateral pelvic tilt, what happens? The pelvis, the iliac crest moves upward or downward, up hike or down hike. 
the lateral pelvic tilt are a motion in which the iliac crest it can move upward or it can move downward both are an example of lateral pelvic tilt so in lateral pelvic tilt your pelvis has two options the first option is the iliac crest can move upwards okay this is the lateral movement iliac crest can move upwards and if the iliac crest move upwards what happens it is going to produce the abduction see it is going to produce the abduction if the iliac crest moves upwards and if the iliac crest is moving downwards it is going to produce the adduction it is going to produce the adduction so uh, iliac crest moving upwards can move and uh, can produce the abduction and iliac crest moving downwards can produce the adduction uh, relatively lesser terms so all of you can understand this if you are going to stand in the unilateral stand you lift your pelvis in the neutral position you place it now your lift you can feel that it is moving upwards it is moving that out. If you are not flexing your knee, this will move for the abduction. This is easy for the abduction. This is some gait that is assumed by people who have abductor muscle weakness. They will move with the pelvic hike, like the lateral pelvic hiking. Okay, and the second movement that is possible is the pelvis can move downwards, which is the adduction, which is the adduction. So in lateral pelvic tilt, the pelvis has two options, that is up hiking or down hiking. In up hiking, what happens is the pelvis move upwards and it can produce an abduction. Down hiking, what happens is the pelvis can move downwards and it can result in adduction. Similarly, place the, uh, take the example of left leg, your right leg is a reference, your left leg, pelvis can move upward. This is known as up hiking, lateral pelvic tilt. See, it is producing abduction. Now similarly, it can move downwards. It is producing adduction. It is producing adduction. Clear? That is all about the pelvic tilt. So pelvic tilt is a mechanism in which the pelvis can move upwards or pelvis can move downwards. Pelvis can move laterally. That is known as the lateral. See, this is the neutral position. This is the lateral pelvic tilt upwards. This is the lateral pelvic tilt downwards. This is constant. Lateral pelvic tilt upward, lateral pelvic tilt downward. Clear? That's the two things that I want to tell you. And then there is lateral pelvic shift which we will discuss in the next chapter. I don't want to confuse you. Next schedule, we will discuss that. Before that, the anterior and posterior pelvic tilt, which plane does it occur? It is going for producing the flexion. See, this one. Posterior tilt, this one, I did it. So it occurs in the sagittal plane, so coronal axis. And what about the lateral pelvic tilt? It is producing abduction. So that happens in the frontal plane and in the frontal plane and in which axis? If the movement is happening in the frontal plane, it should be in which axis? AP axis. That is exactly correct. It should be in AP axis. So, anterior and posterior pelvic tilt occur in the sagittal plane, coronal axis. This one occurs in the frontal plane and in the AP axis. So, we will summarize the motion of the pelvis on the femur as two motion. One is the anterior pelvic tilt. Don't forget that. And next is the lateral pelvic tilt. Never forget that. <laughs> and in the next uh, next schedule, in the next video we will be discussing lateral pelvic shift and anterior and posterior rotation of the pelvis and then the uh, combined motion lumbar pelvic rhythm and so on we will be discussing that no need to worry about that before that if you like the video kindly click the like button and don't forget to subscribe my channel i would be very happy if you have some feedback to share in the comment section below please do that stay tuned see you in the next class thank you